I want you to open your heart and open your Bibles as we go to Exodus chapter 17, verse 1 through 7. And we're going to stand for the reading of God's word, even if you can't read. Just stand there and look important. <laughs> yeah, fake it till you make it. Hallelujah. The whole Israel community set out from the desert of sin, traveling from place to place. Pay attention to that. Traveling from place to place. Traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. God put them on the road. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. So they quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses replied, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water and they grumbled against Moses. They said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? Then Moses cried out to God, what am I to do with these people? Lord, it's been a few times. <laughs> I said it myself, dear Jesus. They are almost ready to stone me. Listen to what bothered him about what they did. They're almost ready to stone me. The Lord answered Moses, go out in front of the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand the staff which you struck the Nile and go. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did in the sight of the elders of Israel in front of his leadership. And he called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord saying, is the Lord amongst us or not? This morning I want to talk from the subject road rage. Look at your neighbor and say, do you have road rage? <laughs> Spirit of God, we invite you now. Come real close. Engage us, empower us, enlighten us, inform us, transform us. Illuminate your will and plan and purpose for our lives. Prophesy to us. Give us the kind of tenacity that is necessary to surge upward and onward into our destiny. For you have caused us to travel from place to place. And what is clear to us is that we can stay here no longer. <laughs> Change is imminent. <laughs> Change is necessary. I refuse to be the same person in 2022 that I was in 2021. I refuse to face the same problem and the same predicament that I had. Travel is imminent. Set me on the road and give me the courage to move from place to place for the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and you delight in my way. Lead me in a plain path because of my enemies. I need to see clearly what you would have me to do. Give me that transitory mentality that's necessary not to fall so in love with what is that I can't catch what's coming. Have your way! In Jesus' name, somebody shout amen. amen. You may be seated. Yeah, let's go to work. So I basically want to uh, just talk to you this morning. I want to take you to Starbucks and get you a latte and sit down and have a conversation. I want to use this text as a canvas on which you and I can paint an illustration that is relevant to you. The purpose is not so much to exegete the text alone, but to use the text not only historically, 
but metaphorically so that you can better understand what is happening in your life in this season. The text starts out on a very irritating tone. It is frustrating. The people are frustrated because their norms have been shattered. And anytime your norm is shattered, you bear an emotional toll whether you express it or not. Nobody has attacked them at this point. No enemy has besieged them at this point. But the pressure of the uncertainty of going from place to place takes its own toll. You want to know how am I going to make it and where am I going to stay and what am I going to eat and what am I going to drink and what am I going to do? If you're like me, you're the kind of person that likes to have some answers before you make movements. But occasionally God will cause you to move without answers and give you answers as you go. And it is very difficult to deal with people who are frustrated, to lead people who are frustrated is it, 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 quite difficult. And, and Moses uh, became exasperated with them. They were exasperated with him. He was exasperated with them. And he cries out to God, what am I to do with these people? These people are getting on my nerves. Often he and God would argue whose people they were. The Lord told him, they're your people. Moses said, no, they're not, they're your people. Yeah, he had the kind of conversation and ability to interact with God that perhaps somebody else would have got killed for. But Moses was a leader. He was a leader. Title or not, he was a leader. There is a distinction between titles and leadership. There's nothing worse than calling somebody by a title and them not be the leader that matches up with the title. Now to be sure to be a leader is a difficult thing because the expectations rest on you. And the expectations rest on you whether it was your fault or not. They expect you to fix things that are unfixable change things that are beyond your grasp. Moses is wrestling with a problem that he did not create and he could not create and he could not uh, fix, but they charged him as if it was his fault. So you cannot be sensitive and be a leader. You have to be tough enough to understand that you don't respond to every accusation and allegation because sometimes the question has more to do with the questioner than it does you. You're the one that's frustrated. You're the one that's at the end of your rope. And they're complaining about being thirsty. And I thought to myself, if there was no water, then wasn't Moses thirsty too? But we often forget that our leaders are also one of us. <laughs> and we expect them to be superhuman as if they have no need. But in reality, if there was no water to drink, then Moses' mouth was dry too. And often the challenge with being a leader is that you are exempted and opted out of the opportunity to be human. Moses is one of my heroes, not because he was a perfect leader, but he was a powerful leader. He was a relentless leader. He had found the thing he was born to do, and he didn't find it at first. It takes a while to find the thing you were born to do. Most of the time you end up doing the things you have to do, not really recognizing the thing you were born to do. And then when you find the thing that you're born to do, you have to figure out how you're going to do it. Because there are lots of ways to do it. Here's the first indication of a leader. You must be willing to be unorthodox. There's nothing worse than putting a person into leadership who is more worried about fitting in 
then they are standing out. Unorthodox really in its origin means to be out of the ordinary, not the previously accepted ideology, not mimicking the methods of the people who are surrounding you. All of our great leaders throughout history were always unorthodox, rule breakers. If you expect to be written about, you got to be willing to break some rules. If you're more concerned about fitting in, then just be the status quo. But nobody writes about people who follow the status quo. When Martin Luther typed the 96 Thesis on the door of the church as history proclaims that he did, if he did that, he, he was willing to be unorthodox and was ridiculed and was criticized and they tried to kill him because he wouldn't act like one of them. Martin Luther was an unorthodox leader. Martin Luther King Jr. was an unorthodox leader. He didn't quite fit in with Malcolm. He didn't quite fit in with the Panthers. He didn't quite fit in with the generation before him. His method of courage like the Panthers, coupled with peace like a Christian, made him an oddity. Are you willing to be odd? Are you willing to be different? Nobody follows people who follow trends. A great leader creates trends, stands out, does things differently. Moses, in my estimation, is one of the greatest leaders of the Old Testament. He follows after the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But he is a great, great leader so much that God protected him all of his life. Not that he didn't have peril, not that he didn't have a rough childhood, not that he wasn't denied the right to grow up in a normal Israelite family. All of that was taken from him. But all of that has something to do with how God shaped him. He grew up where he was a misfit. He couldn't quite fit in as an Israelite or a Hebrew because he was raised like an Egyptian. And he talked like an Egyptian. And he was educated like an Egyptian. And he understood the protocol of an Egyptian. He had never woken up a day in his adult life living in a slave quarter. And yet he is called to lead people that he's kin to, but he's not their kind. He couldn't stay with the people that he was their kind because he wasn't their kin. And so one of the proclivities of being a leader is to have the ability to adapt and become comfortable with being controversial. It isn't just that he is the pastorpreneur of the era, though he was. Moses is the leader of the Old Testament church. The very first inkling of an understanding of the church comes through the ecclesia, the called out ones. They were called out of slavery to establish not only the Old Testament church of which he is the shepherd of the sheep leading them. He is also the, 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 the head of state when it comes to organizing a nation of people that were once slaves. And they have cried out to God for their freedom, and Moses has come to deliver them from the oppression of Pharaoh, but he was delivering people that didn't always like him. And if you have too much of a need to be liked, you can't be a great leader because you're too much of a pleaser. I, I'm just giving you some guidelines. If, if, if it becomes more important to you to be liked than it is to lead, you're probably not a leader. You just have a title and you're in a tough position because something you do is going to frustrate somebody no matter which decision you make. Can I go deeper? Now, the metrics of leadership is movement. 
You can't be say you're a leader if you don't have any metrics to prove you are moving things. So don't go by the title and don't just go by the preaching. How much difference are you making and how do you quantify the distance between with you and without you? And if without you looks just like with you, then you're not a leader, you're a placeholder. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So we want to have some measurements. What, what are the measurements that you measure whether you're a leader or not? Well, this is not for me. I'm not a leader. Everybody in this room is a leader in one way or another. They have a degree of leadership responsibility because leadership at its core means influence. And if you have any influence, if it's just over your children, if it's just over your sister, if it's just over your mama, if it's just over yourself, you have the responsibility to adapt to it as much as possible to an understanding of seeing yourself as a leader. If not, you have to sit and wait on somebody to follow. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Leadership is what the bubble calls, what the Bible calls favor. Yeah, because if leadership is influence, influence is favor. It's not a title, it's not a stage, it's not visibility. It may increase your affluence, but more stage time doesn't equate to influence. There's a difference between affluence and influence. The stage gives you affluence, but it doesn't necessarily mean you have influence. Sometimes the people who are not on the stage have more influence than the people who stand on the stage and often hire the people on the stage. And yet we have a tendency to desire the light. So we'd rather be in the light than on the building. We would rather be in the light than on the building because whoever owns the building doesn't get seen, but they have the influence to make the decision about who stands on the stage. Are you hearing what I'm saying? The actor gains affluence, can't go anywhere, can't go into grocery store, people taking pictures of them everywhere, but the studio has influence. Are you hearing what I'm saying? There are many, many singers that became very, very famous and died very, very broke. And they had affluence and they had fan clubs and they had fan page and they had to deal with tabloids, but they ended up with little or nothing to show for what they had. And they had very little to show for what they had because they had affluence does not equate to influence. We are not trained to look for influence we are trained to look for affluence. So we prosper in areas that give us affluence. We want to be preachers. We want to be football players. We want to be basketball stars. We want to be hip hop artists. We want stage. We don't want to own the label. We don't want to own the company. We don't want to own the studio. We don't want to own. <laughs> So what we have modeled in front of us is affluence at a time that the world is looking for somebody with influence. Affluence shines on the stage. Influence shines in the boardroom. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? And, and I feel like God is getting ready to shift some of you into places of influence and your influence is getting ready to increase. And you have been d disappointed with life because you never got affluence. But the Lord told me to tell you, I didn't give you affluence because I'm getting ready to give you. Oh, I'm talking to somebody. 
So when I'm talking to leaders, I'm talking to you. You don't even know it yet because the world has not recognized you as a leader. They've recognized you to a degree as a person with talent, but they don't see you as a leader. And it's because you're getting affluence, but you haven't gotten influence. And influence is getting ready to break forth in your life like you've never seen it before. As soon as you let go of your addiction to affluence, Nothing worse than hiring somebody into an influential position and all they want is affluence. Nothing worse than having a pastor who is a leader and all he wants to do is preach. Pastoring is much bigger than preaching. It is leading. It is looking at the metrics and seeing how much distance have you covered. And it's not just quantity, it's quality. It's not always about having a bigger church, it's about having a better church. We have fallen in love with bigger and not better. But the metrics that we might be measured by might not be numerical metrics, it might be the depth to which you have influenced the lives of the people that heard you. But you don't want that because you don't get credit for being a great pastor. You get credit for having a big church. And America in particular is in love with affluence. We, 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 we stand for hours to take pictures of people on the red carpet who have affluence and the people who, who sign the contract for the people that are on the red carpet walk right past you and you pay them no attention because we do not glorify leadership, we glorify light. But the reason I thought it was important, normally I would just teach something like this at a leadership conference, and I do have some things that I'm going to teach that, but I'm going to give you a little precursor today in case you don't make it, or in case you do come, you'll come with your head on straight. The Bible said in Luke 2.52, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. Favor with man is influence. Favor with God is influence. To have favor with God means I can speak up and say things to God and things will change. And what is powerful about Luke 2.52 is that Jesus increased. If Jesus increased, that means that I can increase. I can start out with no influence and end up with all kinds of influence. My influence can increase. And one of the ways to know that you're your influence is increasing is by the level of your attack. Some people have not earned the right to be severely attacked or greatly attacked because they don't have great enough influence. When the enemy sees that you're about to get greater influence, he sends on greater demons to attack your life, to assassinate the destiny that is over your life. Hallelujah. The devil doesn't know it, but he's warning you of what is about to come by the level of attack that precedes the next move that's coming in your life. Who am I talking to today? So I want to talk to you about this in three dimensions. I want to talk to you about leading. I want to talk to you about learning. And I want to talk to you about legacy. You have to understand that if you're going to lead, you have to learn. You can't become inflexible and stop learning and get so busy in your leading that you stop learning. Moses was a leader that God had selected to do great things, not only spiritually, not only spiritually, but governmentally, Moses was to be a multifaceted leader. Write that down, multifaceted leader. You can be a leader and be multifaceted. Don't let people pigeonhole you and limit you to how they understand you rather than living your life to the fullness of your uniqueness and be willing to evolve and learn and be a multifaceted leader. 
he has up under his auspices the responsibility of establishing their worship. But he also has to establish their government, their protocol, their rules. So in the Pentateuch, you will see God giving the Ten Commandments, you will see God giving the ordinances, and you will see God giving the ceremonies. The ceremonies inhabit the worship. The ordinance inhabits the government, how you judge one another, how you handle each other's run-ins and obstacles and adversities. The Ten Commandments was to Israel what the Constitution is to the country. You have to have one set of principles. You can't have five different principles in the same organization. Bringing whatever you have influence over to a common set of basic ideals that defines you and sets you apart is important. And it's not just good enough for you to know it. The people up under you have to know it. And then you have a criteria to pick out who goes with you because if you can't align with my vision, then you can't stay on my team. You have to see how your life's vision fits into my vision in order for you to be a good fit up under the wings of my umbrella because if you don't, you have your own agenda and when you come into my atmosphere with your agenda, you turn my vision into division and when we find division, we have to let you go. You cannot counsel out division. When you have two different visions, one of us has got to go. Lot had to separate from Abraham. It's only when you can find a way to fit your vision up under my vision, and let me say it in a biblical way, how can two walk together save they agree? Now, the fact that Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and favor with God and with man, say that with me, Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and favor with God and with man lets me know that I need influence with God because favor is influence and I need influence with man. And if the enemy can't take away my influence with God, he will attack my influence with man. I can be anointed, have influence with God, and destroy my reputation and lose influence with men, and still be as anointed as I ever was with God, but be totally ineffective with men because I have lost my influence with men, though I maintain my influence with God. I will always be God's man. But I might not be his man that he can use because I am still having influence with God, but I have damaged my influence with man. Note to self, protect your influence with man at all costs because if you lose your influence with man, you limit your ability to be effective though you still have influence with God. I'm not saying you can't survive it. I'm, I'm saying you're going to suffer from it. I'm saying you're going to have loss from it. I'm saying that influence with men is fickle. And it's hard enough to keep when you've done your best. Because there's always some snake crawling around trying to bite and destroy your influence with man. You don't want to help the snake bite you. Can I go deeper with this thing? They had one body of principles and ideas that all of them had to learn. And Moses understood when he established the Ten Commandments, the judgments, and the ordinances. I meant to say it that way. The Ten Commandments, the judgment, and the ordinance are the three divisions that established them and set them apart from the Egypts, the Egyptians, and the Hittites, and the Jebusites. It wasn't their look. It wasn't their clothing. It was their principles. We work too much on our appearance and too little on our principles. 
We work too much on our image and too little on our realities. So we spend all of our money looking successful. Oh, y'all ain't gonna help me. Rather than being successful. If you were what you look like, you, wouldn't, you would be able to sleep at night. But we have a tendency to spend the money that God gave us to take us to the next level on our image and not on our reality. So the first thing we do when a door is open to us is try to look the part. And we spend all of our resources on trying to look the part rather than to be the part. It's one thing to look like a president and it's another thing to be one. Do you want to have the look or do you want to have the being? Now, the look will fool people for a while, for man looks on the outer appearance, but the look will never fool God because God looks on the heart. And at the end of the day, what's in the heart will trump what's on the body. You can't fake knowledge. You either know it or you don't. You can't fake knowledge. You either got it or you don't. I can dress like a doctor. I can wear the clothing of a doctor. I can wear the shoes of a doctor. But when you put me in the operating room, you're going to readily find out I'm not a doctor, even though I might know some terms that make me sound like a doctor. I've got to be more than a look when I got a scalpel in my hand. The church has accepted a lot of people who look like leaders, who know a few things that they saw on Instagram like leaders, and they've got a few slogans and no context to put it in context to go along with the slogans, and they, they string together sayings that they got off of Twitter into sermons, and when they run out of cliches, they start talking about people because they are trying to produce something that they are not. And you cannot produce what you are not. I can teach what I know, but I can only produce what I am. If I learn Mandarin, I can teach Mandarin, but that doesn't make me Chinese. So I can teach Mandarin, but when I have a baby, the baby is not going to come out Chinese because I can only produce what I am. You will only go as far as you are. You cannot produce what's not in you. Stop trying to be other people because it's not in your inventory to do what they do. You must be authentic. You must be yourself, even at the risk of being unorthodox. You have to be who God made you. You have to do it the way God gave you to do it. You have to speak it the way God gave you to speak it. You have to be an original. Authenticity is imperative for great leadership. I can learn like from you, but I can never be you. So the only thing I want from a mentor is to learn principles and concepts. But when it, once I learn the principles and the concepts, I can't be my teacher. I can only be myself. Uniform ideas create justice. You can't have one set of principles for your friends and another set of principles for your foes. You can't have one set of principles for this group in your office and another set of principles for another group in your office. Uniformity creates justice. Justice must be blind. It can't blink because you're a woman. It can't blink because you're cute. It can't blink because you're fine. Fine might get you a date, but it won't get you a job. It can't blink because you're nice looking. It's got to be fair and equitable and even across the board. So being nice can only take you so far. Sooner or later, you're going to have to go from personality to performance. Have you ever seen somebody try to fake you out with nice? 
and they thought if you liked them well enough that you would always call them. If I call you to cut the grass, I don't care how nice you are. If you can't cut the grass, I'm going to call somebody else. Nice does, personality does not trump performance, but it will hinder it. It's not that personality is not important, but if all you got is personality, you know, it's not going to do me any good. I don't want to go to a doctor and all I'm able to say about him is, he's so nice. He don't know nothing, but he's so nice. He cut out my lungs, but he's so nice. I want him to be nice, but I want him to be knowledgeable. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And I want to be treated with fairity, fairness. Now, what is happening here is Moses is leading people with motion sickness. He is leading people with motion sickness. I don't have much motion sickness, but my wife has a lot of motion sickness. She can ride in a car most of the time, but maybe not in the back seat. She doesn't do well on a boat, so a cruise is a challenge because motion makes her sick. It's called motion sickness. And if she doesn't take some medicine, she can't take a boat ride because of motion sickness. And most of us are leading people who have motion sickness. Moses is leading people who haven't moved for 430 years. And now he's got them living on the road. And the very fact that they have motion sickness makes them difficult to move. And Moses is a leader, and the only metric of leadership is movement. If he doesn't move, he's not a leader. But if he moves them, they're going to have motion sickness because they have not moved for 430 years. They have spiritual atrophy. Most churches have spiritual atrophy. Atrophy is when you haven't moved something in so long, it ceases to move without pain. Most churches have spiritual atrophy. No, we've always done it like that. You always sing the song before you read the prayer. Deacon Wilson always takes up the offering. That's atrophy. Anytime people start talking about always and they worship normalcy more than they worship movement, it becomes difficult to lead them because they're uncomfortable with change. And Moses has the dubious task of trying to move people who have spent 430 years being motionless. So the Bible says that they were moved by God from place to place. And anytime God has you moving from place to place, you're leading through uncertainty. You don't know what's going to happen next. Reading their journey is like reading a good movie. One moment they're fighting Amalek at Rephidim, and the next moment they can't find any water. The next chapter you turn over into, the snakes are coming out and biting them. And the next chapter you turn into, to, God has covered them with a cloud of fire to keep them warm at night. And the moment you get used to the cloud of fire, he has turned into a pillar of smoke by day. And then you turn past the next chapter and they come to a place filled with palm trees and fresh water. And you walk on a little further and they come to a dry place. And every time they kept moving, they kept blaming Moses because they had motion sickness they had moved for 430 years. Some of you listening at me right now have not changed in 20 or 30 years. And now this pandemic is driving you crazy because it's forcing you to have to move and you're uncomfortable because you have spiritual atrophy and you keep waiting for God to make it like it was. And success for you is for God to take you back to what you're used to. But I came to tell you that God has closed up the Red Sea and you can't go back to what it was. You must adapt to what it is, what it is, what it is, what it is, what it is. You got to you gotta adapt to what it is, not what it was, not what it will be. You got to adapt to what it is, what it is. Am I talking to somebody today? 
See, the, the, most of us are trying to manage people. You got wives trying to manage husbands. You got husbands trying to manage wives. You've got parents trying to manage children. You got people trying to manage life. Most of us are trying to manage people. You're upset with people because they won't be managed. They won't do what you tell them to do. They won't go where you tell them to go. God does not call you to manage people. He calls you to lead people. Once God calls you to lead people, he will call you to manage procedures. I was talking to a lady, Patricia Howroy, and she almost knocked me out of my chair with this point. You manage procedures, you lead people. We don't spend enough time managing procedures. We as preachers are so busy making sermons, we don't want to be bothered with procedures. And long after the sermon is over, the church has to live with the procedures. And now the pandemic has come to preachers who spend all their time studying for the sermon and they get the sermon so that they can move people and they're not used to managing procedures. That means that you've got to be willing to tweak your procedures. That means you've got to be a person who stops saying, this is just how I do it. This is just how I am. This is just the way it is. You cannot fall in love with the procedure. The procedure's got to be willing to change so that the results can increase. Who am I talking to? The procedures have got to be willing to change so that the results can increase. That's why you take your car for a tune-up, so that you can adjust the procedures to increase the performance. You have no more performance than you have willingness to adjust the procedures. In other words, if you always do what you've always done, you will always be where you've always been. Not because you didn't have a vision, not because you didn't want to go forward, but because you refuse to change the procedures. If you don't change the procedures, you can't have the promotion. And I came to tell somebody you've been working hard on the wrong stuff. You're trying to manage people, and people will always break out from people who manage them. That's why they're in the wilderness in the first place is because they are tired of being managed by Pharaoh. They have broken away from the bondage of having to live my life by your rules. You may be my wife, but this is my life. I may be your husband, but this is your life. You can't manage my life with your opinions. What has to happen is we lead people, we manage procedures, because people will always leave managers. People will eventually break away from people who manage them. Because to manage me is to dominate me like I am an inanimate object and I don't have an opinion. You can lead me, but you can't manage me. We need to spend more time managing the procedures, measuring the results, and leading the people. So I'm trying to bring people into a procedure that has metrics of performance. I gotta go, I gotta go, I can't stay on that. <laughs> People change in uncertainty. You don't know who you got until you get them in an uncertain environment. You don't know what you got to deal with as long as we was dating, as long as we was hanging out, as long as you had time to get your hair done, as long as you had time to get your nails done, as long as you had time to schedule me into your schedule, that's one thing. But people, when you start putting them in situations of uncertainty, they change. And all of a sudden, you 
you get to see who they really are because if I take you away from your familiar, I get to find out who you are. Can I go deeper? I, this is why I want you to be at the leadership conference. This is why you need to be there whether you're a pastor or not or an entrepreneur or not. It's because God is getting ready to increase your favor with God and with man. God is getting ready to increase your influence with God and with man. Everybody in here who has been sensing that God is getting ready to increase you, and maybe you've been a little scared of it, and maybe you've been a little shy of it, but there's been something speaking in your ear, and sometimes at the wrong season in your life to you, that God is getting ready to increase your influence. Jump up and give God a praise right now. I'm just teaching today. I'm not worried about making you shout. But I want you to understand something. Increase means uncertainty. Increase means going into the unfamiliar. Increase means being prepared to lead people who don't like you. <laughs> You got to be prepared to lead people who don't like you. And the problem with you is that you want to be liked. And you want to be liked even if you have to stop leading. And then you wonder why you're not going anywhere. It's because you changed the goal from leadership to likership. Until you are willing to be controversial and be disliked and lead people that are murmuring and complaining, you will never be able to lead people. If you use their reaction as the thermometer to your progress, as if something is wrong because they're murmuring, you will stop growing. Because if you read the text, these people were always murmuring. They were always had road rage. Every time he moved them, they was complaining about something. That's what got them bit Wednesday night by the snakes. They were murmuring and complaining, and God sent the snakes out. Now when they're not complaining about the snakes now they're complaining about the water there's no water out here people will always complain when you take them out of their comfort zone because being stretched is uncomfortable being stretched is painful. Being stretched activates muscles and cells and nerves and tendencies that have been dormant. Being stretched is the strategy of where we are right now. Clearly, 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 God is stretching all of us. He is stretching us. He is stretching us. He has got us out of our comfort zone. We are all bickering with each other. We are all angry with each other. We are getting on each other's nerves because we are being stretched. Nobody is totally sure what's going to happen next. Not the experts, not the news commentators, not the haters, not the spectators, not the preachers, not the pastors. Nobody knows for sure what's going to happen next because God is stretching us and taking us from place to place and we are on the road and some of us have got a lot of rage but the time has come for you to release your rage and get back on the road and do what God called you to do with your mouth closed because if you don't shut your mouth you're going to delay your journey and die in the wilderness when you could have been in the promised land because you can't stop murmuring and complaining and crying out to God, Lord, make it like it was. I hate to tell you this, it will never be like it was. Your marriage won't be like it was. Your children won't be like it was. You won't be like it was. Your church won't be like it was. Your nation won't be like it was. Nothing stays like it is except death.
If you want to stay young, die young. The only way to forever be 21 is die at 21. Let it be your last birthday. Death will stop the birthdays. Death will stop the birthdays. But if you're going to live, you're going to change. You can go screaming. You can go crawling. You can go complaining. You can be dragged into it. You can sit back and watch it happen and not do nothing about it. But you must be prepared if you're a leader for change. Agile on your feet. Mobile in your thinking. Not in love with your own procedures. The problem with many in my generation is that they are in love with their old procedures. So they refuse to do church in new and creative ways and they refuse to adapt to technology. And now we're in a situation where sometimes technology is the only way we can communicate and you refuse to learn it because you thought that you could opt out of it. But you can't opt out of change. When change comes, you got to go back to school. You you gotta go back to school. This is a learning season. It's not just a leading season. It's a learning season. And Moses, as gifted as he was, as anointed as he was, as ordained as he was, still had to learn. Sit down, sit down. I'm just talking to you. Is this good? Is this helping anybody? He had to learn that people change in uncertainty. He had to learn that the people who left willingly with him soon turned against him. They turned against him before he got to the Red Sea. It's an interesting fact that many of the people who voted for President Trump also voted for President Obama. Check it out. Google it. The ratio of people who voted for Trump is in many cases similar to the same people who voted for Obama, which means they didn't vote for either one, they voted for change. It changed by any means necessary. And you can say whatever you want to about it one way or the other. If you are in a struggling state, if you're in a struggling atmosphere, if you're in a struggling economy, it doesn't matter what the stock market is if you don't have no money in it. Oh, the stock market is doing good. What does that have to do with me having beans in the refrigerator? People vote according to what they see in their environment. And they will change from Baptist to Methodist, from Methodist to non-denominational. They will change from Democrat to Republican. Even the candidates will change. They will change their position. They will change what they say because in uncertainty, people change. Now to him whom much is given, much is required. And some of you are intimidated because God is putting you in a situation that is too big for you, but just because it's too big for you doesn't mean it's not that, it, that it's not yours to do. Can I go deeper? I want to talk to all the people who sense that God is about to give you increase. I want to talk to you for a minute about weight distribution. I want you to understand that Moses had to learn several things. Number one, when, when Moses committed the murder in Egypt and he had to flee to Jethro's house, he started learning leadership with sheep. When God called Moses through the burning bush, Moses was leading sheep. That was his job. That was his first job. He had always lived in the palace. He has gone from being a prince in the palace to a shepherd with sheep. Because God will give you your destiny in seed form early. Whatever you have become right now, you were in some ways that when you were a child. 
There's something that happened to you, something that motivated you, something that stirred you, something you were running from or something you were running to, whether you used it rightly or wrongly. If you are a leader now, you've always been a leader. If you're an influencer now, you've always been an influencer. You might have been a drug dealer influencer. You might have been a pimp influencer. You might have been a bad boy influencer, but you have always influenced people. And God is trying to take that gift and take it from his perversion to its conversion so that he can convert it into something he can use. There is not one person in this room that God cannot use. There is something in your history, something in your story, something in your agony, something in your pain that has prepared you for something bigger than yourself. The question is, do you have the flexibility to transfer from leading sheep to leading people? Let me go a little bit deeper. I wish I had more time. When God meets Peter, Peter is down by the boat mending his nets. Jesus asked Peter, can I borrow your boat? Peter said, go ahead, I'm not using it. He pushed out a little bit from land and Peter's boat or his business became God's platform. Is your business God's platform? I'm not going to bother that. So Peter pushed out a little bit from land. Jesus is standing on Peter's business as a platform to do his preaching. And Peter is a fisher of fish. And Jesus says to him, watch this, because here's my point. He says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. In other words, you got the skill set from fishing for fish. I'm going to transfer it and now make you fishers of men. Whatever you are going to be is hidden in the details of your history. You got to learn though because practice is not like recital. So he practiced on sheep. And then God let him practice his miracles in the desert. When the burning bush came, can I go a little bit deeper? I'm having a good time. I like to teach leadership. When the burning bush came, God said, we need to practice. You need to practice for what's next before you get there. You need to practice. So here's, here's how we're going to practice. Stick your hand in your bosom. He took his hand in his bosom. It came out white as snow. God said, stick it in again. It came back out. It was healed. He said, let go of your stick. And it turned into a snake. He said, grab the snake by the tail. That took a lot of courage. He grabbed the snake by the tail. It turned into a stick again. He said, pour out water. He poured out water and it turned to blood. And God said, okay, we're done with rehearsal. Let's go and perform. Let's go to Pharaoh's house and we're going to do these tricks on the road. We're taking these tricks on the road. Write that down. We're taking these tricks on the road. The things you learned in private, God's going to use in the open. We're taking these tricks on the road. You were never wasting your time. Even when you were shoveling sheep dung, even when you were taking care of sheep, it was on the job training for what God is about to do in your life. Everything you've been through, every night you cried, Every night you felt denied. Every day you felt overlooked. Every day you felt like it wasn't ever going to happen was all rehearsal. Now we get ready to play the game. Let the band play. Let the music start. Let the dancers dance. Bring the cheerleaders out. The game is about to begin. Go down there and tell Pharaoh that God said, let my people go. Excuse me, I got a question. Who shall I say sent me? I'm too big to be defined. I'm too big to be locked up in a definition. Just tell him I am that I am because I am so ambidextrous. I'll be bread when you're hungry. I'll be water when you're thirsty. I'll be a way when there is no way. I'll be a cloud above you by night. I'll be a pillar of fire when you're cold. Whatever you need me to be, I can become whatever you need me to be. I'm flexible. And if you're going to be like me, you got to be flexible. You got to be able to be more than one thing. I break the cage that locked you down to one dimension, that's kept you back in the sheepfold, that's kept you handling sheep when you were called to lead nations. My God, I feel like I'm talking to somebody. 
I don't know who it is, but whoever it is, wave your hand at me. Type on the line, make some noise, holler at your boy, let me hear from you. Give me a clap sign, give me a signal, let me know I'm talking to you. If I'm getting you ready for what's next in your life, if I'm getting you ready for what's next in your life, holler at me, I can't hear y'all. Sit down, I'm going a little bit deeper. Can I go? Y'all ready to go with me? So they got road rage because they're out of their comfort zone. They got road rage because they're being stretched. They got road rage because they have to use their lesser used muscles. Pastor Tubman and I listened to one trainer talk about how some of these guys can be all buff and be built and, and, and be, be muscular and be muscle bound and have big muscles and can't handle small weights. Because just because you got big muscles right here don't mean you got big muscles right here. The muscle you work on is the muscle that builds. So you can look good and get in a fight and get your tail whipped because you worked out on the wrong muscles. Some of you have been working real hard on the wrong muscle set. You've become real good at doing something that is unfruitful and you've got to be willing to change. I, oh God, I decree and declare there will be massive change in your life. You will not waste another year building up a muscle group you don't need. God is getting ready to put you in areas that's going to stretch the weaknesses in you that they may become stronger. So Moses went from leadership to learning. He went from leadership to learning. And when he gets to Jethro's house, he learns by handling sheep, which is practice for handling people. When he gets to the burning bush, he learns how to do his miracles in the privacy before God before he does it in front of his enemies. Because if it doesn't work in the glory, it, go, it ain't gonna work in your life. Can, can I go deeper with this? Now he's leading the people, but he's leading them like they're sheep. The sheep have one shepherd and a stranger's voice they will not follow. So Moses is leading the children of Israel and all roads lead to him. All decisions come to him. All responsibilities come to him. And Jethro comes down to visit him. And when Jethro comes down to visit him, the Bible says that Jethro just sat back and watched him all day long. This is one generation watching another generation. He watched him all day long. And Moses did nothing all day but hear the grievances of the people who had road rage. She took my this, she's using my tent. He stole my wife. They went off with my kid. This one took my dog, this one took my cat. And at the end of the day, Moses was exhausted. Moses was exhausted. And when, he, when his father-in-law looked at him and he said, you're not doing it right. The journey is too great for you to do <laughs> with the procedure you have in place. You got a sheep procedure in a national opportunity. If there, and I love education, I believe in education, I think education is real important. But if there is one weakness in education, one of it is, is that education doesn't prepare you for protocol and application. So you have the facts to get the job, but you don't know how to talk in the office. So the moment you get angry in the office, you go back to your hood girl routine. I, I tell you what, because <laughs> you, you got a master's degree, but behind the master's degree, you still boo-boo. And if they wake up boo-boo, it's gonna be hell up in this office. I'm not going to HR, I'm not filing a grievance, I'm going to kick this chair back and you and me, you want some of this? And now you get disqualified for something you've been training six years for, you've got the education to do it, but not the discipline to function in it. 
Y'all ain't gonna talk to me, but I know I'm talking good. I know I'm talking good. I, I can call some names of people that I know that are qualified, but got disqualified because they have road rage. And any time they get on the road, the rage comes out. Am I talking to anybody? And then God says to him, you can't be a one-man band like you were with the sheep because these are people. They're going to have all kinds of problems. They can talk. The, anything that can talk is going to give you some trouble. That's why a dog is a man's best friend. <laughs> I don't care what you say to me, a dog, I don't know if it's true about women, but a dog is a man's best friend because a dog will lick you, lock you, and never say nothing. Everybody else got a mouth going to talk. If you want a friend you can trust, get a dog. Everybody else is suspect. That's all I want you to be able to say. And be happy to see me when I come home, jump up on my chest and try to lick me in the face. That's all, that's all. I'll feed you and walk you and take you to the vet. We got a deal. Never seen a dog betray its owner. They're not judgmental. They're not self-righteous. They don't break covenant. They don't tell lies. I love them. <laughs> Everybody else I watch with one eye squint. because people change in uncertainty. So then God says to him, something I'm gonna make a quick illustration. Uh, uh, is Don nearby? I want Don to come, I want Frank to come, I want Hattie to come right quick and just stand right up on stage here for a minute. Oh yeah, it's Sister Sutton. She's not Sister Hill anymore. Got to keep up with this. And honey, you come and stand. And y'all stand in front of me, straight across facing the people. Now, yeah, just straight across, like Hattie's doing. Just stand right there. Now, my wife runs the women's department. <laughs> Frank is my CEO over the Potter's house. Don is the executive director of security and safety here at the Potter's house. Hattie Hill is the president of T.D. Jakes Foundation. I didn't pet you, let me pet you. Everybody I patted, everybody I patted, I put pain on. Every one of these people is worried about something that I would have to worry about if they didn't. So what I'm teaching you is that as the vision gets bigger, you need weight distribution. <laughs> weight distribution is worry alignment. That means I gave her something to worry about, I gave him something to worry about, I gave him something to worry about, I gave her something to worry about, all of it would be my worry, but now they share the worry. Who is sharing your worry? Or do you keep on taking on more and more and more and got less weight distribution? So all of a sudden, he's worried about what I don't have to be worried about. And if he ain't worried about it, I'm worried about him. Okay? I got in a staff meeting and flipped completely out and I said, I'm angry because you are not. Because if you would have been angry, I wouldn't have got to be angry. You'd have fixed it before it got to me. So this, though it looks like uh, titles 
and position and power, it's really weight distribution. Because the journey is too great and the meetings are too many and the demands are too massive for me to be all of them. Now there are more that I could call up here. This is just an example. Who is sharing the weight? Who is sharing the weight? If you don't get weight distribution, you are going to burn up, not because it wasn't yours, but because you have not learned how to let go and distribute weight. And you know why you don't distribute weight? Because you got control issues. And as long as you got control issues, you got growth limitations. This is why you need to be at the leadership conference because the concepts that I'm teaching here are many of the concepts that I'm going to elaborate on there. I'm telling you just because you don't have the money for it, just because you don't have the time for it, and just because you feel overwhelmed doesn't mean that God didn't give it to you. God gave it to you, but you've got to build weight distribution before you can have land acquisition. You can't take over new territories by yourself. Can I go just a tiny bit deeper? I don't have to meet with anybody they meet with. I just have to meet with them. I, if I meet with them, come on, come here, Oscar. Is Oscar here? He went out. He went out. Where'd he go? Uh, <laughs> that's a problem. <laughs> Anytime I can't get weight distribution, I can't get alignment. I got all of them standing in alignment. None of them duplicate each other's roles. Every one of them must stay in their lane or it doesn't work. Watch this. Moses took the weight that was on him and distributed it out to 70 men. Yes, sir. It took 70 men to handle his vision, but it was still his vision. Bless, bless. I'm trying to show you how to increase. You got to increase by multiplying yourself and create diversity and still not compromise unity. Bless. I cannot have these four, which really it's about 15 or more on my executive leadership team. I cannot have these four fighting like children. No. I can't have them disagreeing. Yeah. I want them to disagree. Yeah. I want them to debate. Yeah. I want her to fight for the foundation like there ain't nothing else that matters. Yes. And I want him to turn to her and tell her, wait a minute, yeah. the potter's house has something in this too. Yes. And then I want him to say, you can raise all the resources you need, but if we all get shot in here, it's gonna be a problem. And then I want her to say, you don't have no women on the program. Everybody has an area of rule, equal but divided. It took, I want you to get this. Let me, let me show it to you two ways. When Jesus cast the demons out of legion, yeah. all the demons that was in this one man went into a herd of pigs. Yes, sir. It took a herd of pigs to handle the demons that were on one man. It took 70 elders before Moses got relief. Help. Good people are my vacation. Oh. Baby, baby. <laughs> baby, baby. This is Hawaii. There's no need in sending me to Hawaii if all I get to do is worry in a new place. 
the more you lift the weight, the more I get relief. Thank you very much. Just an illustration. So Moses learned that. We all know you married to her. You don't have to come over here and use my message to date in. He said, I'm going to claim my own woman. <laughs> Give God a praise for Brother and Sister Sutton. So write this down. Who's on my team? And how much weight do they carry? Because a lot of people on your team are creating weight not relieving weight. I got to go. I got to go. I got to stop. I got to I got to move from learning cuz I got to touch on legacy. So so I talked about leadership, I talked about learning. I talked about let me talk just a minute about legacy. I sat down with Dr. G the late Dr. KC Price. First time I'd ever sat down and talked to him. I went out to interview him. Yeah. And and there were two things that were big takeaways for me from sitting down to talk to him. He said to me, he said, everybody says they call to preach, and I say preach what? He said, because preach is too broad of a category to build a calling around. He says, my assignment was to preach faith. And I was faithful to my assignment. God called me to teach faith to his people. So he had a clear sense of who he was, okay? And when I got to talk to him, what fascinated me about him, though we are completely different in a lot of ways, uh, what fascinated me about him that caused him to stomp his foot and the whole world shook, you can't go to a part of the world and say Frederick K.C. Price and nobody knows who you're talking about. Like him or not, that has nothing to do with it. What I'm telling you, he Boom, and the world shook. If you want to be a world shaker, you got to talk to world shakers. He said, I had a keen sense of what I was called to do. Do you have a keen sense of what you were called to do? Then I said to him, is there anything that you did that if you had to do over again, you wouldn't do it? He said, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have built the dome. He said, God permitted me to build it but he never directed me to build it. Is, is there a difference? Yes, there is a big difference between God permitting you to do something and directing you to do it. Are you doing it because you're permitted to do it or you're called to do it? Let me go a little further. Things I have learned, this is not Fred, this is me. I have learned that provision follows vision. It doesn't follow need. It doesn't follow hunger. It doesn't follow emotions. Provision follows vision. Do you not know if you got enough vision, you can walk in the bank with a seven year plan and get millions of dollars on something you ain't even done yet? If the vision is strong enough, the provision will overtake you. Do y'all hear what I'm saying? If your vision is strong enough, billionaires will invest into it. They will not invest into it because you want money. I had seven billionaires sitting at the table. I don't mean nothing. They won't invest in it because you want it. If you lay out a vision, in a construct that they can receive, then they will invest according to your vision. Write it, make it plain. Let him that readeth it run thereby. You have to have a clear vision for my money. I can't give my money to something that don't have no eyes. I can't invest in a blind man. I can only invest in somebody who sees something that I agree with. Ooh, y'all got quiet. People not gonna give you money because I need, I need it because I just had another baby. You had that baby. I ain't got nothing to do with you having that baby. That don't have nothing to do with why I should pay you more because you had sex and I had a baby. I wasn't there. 
Your need does not constitute my supply. Y'all don't want to hear this. Because you want people to feel sorry for you and relieve your suffering. That's not how the world works. People invest for return. And if you don't have a vision beyond what you want, that doesn't include what I want, why should I put money into what you want? You don't do that. You know that you only loan money to your cousin Freddie twice. He never paid you back at all. So when his number comes up on the ringtone, you act like you got your phone plugged up. Because Cousin Freddie has taught you that he is a poor investment. So don't be looking at me all funny while I'm trying to tell you people don't invest in blindness. Second thing I've learned, the only people that leave you are those who don't share your vision. Everybody who left me couldn't stay. And everyone who stayed couldn't leave. If people can leave you, let them. Paul said they came out from us because they were not of us. For had they been of us, no doubt they would have continued with us. Sometimes people leaving you is a favor. Y'all ain't gonna talk to me. Sometimes people leaving you is a blessing and you cry and you hurt and you have emotions, but go ahead. When you get through crying, you're gonna be better. Because if you can make it without me, Surely, I have an obligation to show you. I can make it with you okay, I'm okay too. You feel good without me? I got to feel good without you. All I got to do is let you mentor me. Because if you can make it without me, I can make it without you. I'm not going to be the only one walking around crying and running in the walls while you going out to the club. I'm going to get my Jenny Craig on. Hey, 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 yeah, yeah, I'm going to get my Jenny Craig on, get myself together. God does not want you weeping around the tomb of who left while you neglect who stayed. You need to reward people for loyalty. But what happens to us is we are so grieved about who left that we are not taken care of who stayed. And the victory becomes changing the mind of somebody who didn't have your mind in the first place. Final point and I'm almost done. You can't get there if you don't pivot. You can't get there if you don't pivot. I don't know why I'm teaching this to you. This is the stuff we do at leadership conference. I don't know why I'm teaching it. You can't get there if you don't pivot. Now I'm gonna wrap this up because I talked about the rage of the people, okay? I talked about what leadership is. I talked about what learning is. I wanna talk about what legacy is because this is the one place where Moses blows it. This is the one place where Moses blows it. The first time God said, smite the rock, he hit the rock, boom, and the water came out, and God was pleased, because he obeyed. By the second time, the people's road rage had gotten so bad that Moses got mad. Every other time the people railed against him, he prayed, and he was okay but they triggered his old demon. He had always had an anger problem. Remember when he saw the Hebrew and the Egyptian fighting and Moses looked out the window and got mad and went out there and had never been a warrior and murdered the Egyptian. 
him having anger is what caused him to go to the desert in the first place. But all the while he was suppressing his rage. All the while they had road rage. He was suppressing his rage. Have you ever had somebody honk their horn and cuss at you and you suppress your rage because it wasn't that you couldn't think of nothing to say back but you was just saved that day? Y'all ain't gonna be real with me. Where are my real people at? Make some noise. You saved on Tuesday and you just went on and said, bless him, Jesus. Anama shanda ka shobo, shobo shata. Glory to God, hallelujah. Cause you had your prayer light that morning and you was ready for him and you were, but if they'd have caught you on Thursday, and then I climbed out of my car, stood up through the rooftop, went berserk on this guy, and then thought, you can't do this, you're a preacher. I climbed back down in the car, looked around to see if any of y'all was around. I had flipped out. I, I don't even know what I said. But he said something to me that made me forget 40 some years of ministry. And I forgot I was bishop. He was talking to Thomas and Thomas flipped out on him. I stood up in my sports car with the hood off of it, standing up talking about, you want some of this? And I looked around, I didn't see none of y'all. I eased my down in the car and said, praise the Lord. Don't make me go off in here. Don't make me flip out of here. I forgot who I was. I forgot my name. I forgot my address. I forgot my calling. I couldn't think of my social security number. I flipped out on him. I said 12 things before I came to myself and said, oh, the potter's house. I looked around, I was so glad I didn't see none of y'all, and I hope none of y'all saw me, and I ain't saying nothing about what I said, because I can't be sure what I said. I flipped out, Cora, I flipped out. I had a moment of temporary insanity. He called me out my name, and I wanted to tell him I can talk too. The rage is contagious. The rage that has been on them has now gotten to him. It has triggered what he has been suppressing. And now when they rev up against him and they start talking to him and saying, we're thirsty. I know he wanted to say, so am I. You think I don't have a mouth? If you ain't drinking none, I ain't either. You think I'm not healing? This is my problem. Do I make water? So God says to him, watch this closely, this is my close. God said to him, speak to the rock that they may drink. But Moses listened to them and made a decision in rage. Note to all leaders, never decide why you're mad. He made a decision in rage and the Bible says that he smote the rock twice. And when he smote the rock, the water still flowed. In spite of, you don't hear that. Did you hear what I just said? The water still flowed in spite of his disobedience. Just because your water's flowing doesn't mean you're living right. <laughs> Moses did it all wrong and the water still flowed. But as they were drinking, because of his road rage, combined with their road rage, God said to him, you will not see the promised land because you disobeyed me. I'm going to tell you why and I'll live my teaching with this. The reason that God told him to smite the rock the first time is because the rock in the Old Testament is a type of Christ who was smitten for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of his peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. But he was only supposed to be smitten once. 
When God told him, that when he told God they need water, he said, don't hit it again because you're going to break the type. Speak to the rock because once the rock has been smitten once, whenever you need water, he will never have to go through what he went through the first time because one smite did it all. Whenever you need healing, whenever you need deliverance, whenever you need a breakthrough, you'll never have to go through this again. No man took his life, he laid it down. And if he laid it down, he will pick it back up again. And now he ever liveth to make intercession for us. He'll never have to go back to the cross again. And when Moses hit the rock twice, he didn't know it, but he lied on Jesus. He acted like once was not enough. And God wanted us to know, I got it all done with the first blow so that all of your needs can be supplied according to his riches and glory. But because Moses got road rage, he broke the shadow and lost his ticket to the promised land. So he led them to a place that he never got to go himself because he never got rid of his rage. What are you angry about? How can you let your anger forfeit your prophecy? Your anger is about to terminate God's plan for your life. I plan for you to go to the promised land, but if you don't get a grip on your anger, you're going to lose your calling. Who am I talking to? Every time you get mad, every time you get angry, you get yourself in trouble. The last time you got hot, you blew up and delayed your prophecy by 40 years and you spent 40 years in a wilderness you didn't have to go through because you lost your temper and took matters into your own hand. I thought you learned by your 40 year imprisonment not to make a decision in the heat of your anger and here you go again and because you did it again not only did you mess up my shadow you shorten your destiny so God took Moses up into the mountaintop never to be seen again and guess what all the people who had been murmuring against him started crying and they cried 30 days for the man they didn't appreciate when they had him. They cried 30 days when they lost him. The praises of people are fickle. Today they say Hosanna. Tomorrow they say crucify him. And if you live to please them, you will die frustrated, Moses. You know what's killing you, dude? It's not that you're not on the road. There's nothing wrong with your car. It's that you have road rage. And you've never gotten rid of it. I understand why you got it. You didn't grow up in your mama's house. You grew up with strangers. God only knows what happened to you in Pharaoh's house. And you are still angry. And that anger has polluted your marriages, your jobs, your interactions with your own children because you have rage. That rage murdered a man that I had a plan for. That rage 
delayed your destiny 40 years. You could have spoke to Pharaoh from in, inside his house. I had to take you out of it and bring you back to it 40 years later because you are an angry man. And you're angry about things that won't change. I know how important it was to you for the children of Israel to love you because then you would have a people. And I know how you have never had a people. You were too Egyptian to fit in with them and too Hebrew to be one of us. And because you are a leader, you have always been a misfit. And I know it has caused you pain to be unorthodox. But that's who I call to be leaders, is misfits. Great leaders are always weird. If they would have fit, they would have fit. They found themselves by not fitting. <laughs> God called them to him and he never let them fit in. If you would have been comfortable with the slaves, you would have thought like them. If you would have thought like them, you couldn't lead them. If you would have been comfortable with e Egypt, you would have forfeited your destiny. I meant for you to be thrown out of everything you were thrown out of so that as they threw you out, you would find you out. And the very thing that makes you dysfunctional is the same thing that makes you functional. Your misalignment with men is what made you eligible to be in alignment with me. And other prophets have I spoke to through dreams and visions, but of my servant Moses will I speak face to face. When you lost them, you got me. I was their replacement. I was your father. I was your mother. I was your best friend. I played with you. I trained you. I watched over you. I looked out for you. I exposed you to different cultures and different kinds. I educated you. I gave you the opportunity. The reason you can write in the Egyptian language is because I exposed you to things you would have never gotten in your mama's house. Why do you keep weeping for that which I've rejected? You've been an angry man all of your life and everything you lost, your temper took it from you. And this is not gender specific. There are as many angry women as there are angry men. And you cannot enjoy today because you're still angry about yesterday. And I am calling it road rage. Road rage is any rage that is triggered by the journey if you have something that triggers you on your journey, you have road rage. And if you don't deal with your road rage, you're going to cancel out your opportunities. Road rage will make you climb out of a car and not thinking, run back and snatch somebody through a window, not thinking whether they have a gun or not. Road range makes you make dumb decisions. How many decisions have you made out of road rage? Sometimes you're angry with people who aren't even here anymore. Three things, leading, learning, and legacy. Moses messed up his legacy. In a moment of rage, he forfeited the destination. I went to Mount Nebo and stood on top of it. He was so close to the promised land. I mean, you can see it clearly from the top of Mount Nebo. 
You can see the greenery. The desert is over here and the greenery is over here. The shepherds were grazing in the field when I was there. I could see the shepherds grazing in the field. I could see the work going on and the vineyards that were going on all around the Jordan. On one side, it's all sand and on the other side, it's all life. And from Mount Nebo, you can see for miles. Moses got to see it but he never got to be it because he had road rage. I speak to every one of you that are watching me all over the world. That rage undealt with is going to kill you. It will not kill the person you're mad at. It will kill you. You drank the poison and now you're waiting on them to die until you release that rage you will forfeit your opportunity from having the favor influence leadership that god has allocated for you your eyes have not seen your ears have not heard neither have entered into your heart what god has for you if you will let go of that road rage. Moses' story ends less than what it should have been. His feet should have walked into the promised land, but his anger locked it out. Stand to your feet, everyone. The message that lies before you is road rage. You can be entertained by it, you can be educated by it, or you can be changed by it. I pick change. Amen. Question number one. Strip down, take your church face off, take your titles and all your degrees and throw them in the trash. What are you angry about? And what are you going to do about the anger Satan planted to steal your legacy from you? You blame people. You give yourself permission to be crazy. You blame everybody for everything that went wrong. Until you take responsibility, there will be no change. Road rage before you wreck. God wants to deliver you from suppressed rage. Do I have anger? Absolutely. Do I carry it? Absolutely not. I will let you have it in real time speed because I can't sleep angry. I can't think angry. I can't be creative angry. If I'm wrong, you're going to get a chance to tell me I'm wrong, but I will confront you because I will not suppress what I'm feeling lest I pollute where I'm going. 